seen one. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Uh, we've got quite a crowd because uh, we've got two uh, famous local people who know an amazing amount about native plants and how to propagate them and how to uh, identify them and where to find them. And they've even given out a whole bunch of seeds. So uh, we have, we're really fortunate to have uh, Sonia Mason and Pam, I'm gonna mess up that name, Globin? Golden, right. Globin, Go Golden. Oh. Pam Golden, sorry about that, That's uh, to host this meeting. And they're both like deep, they're very local and deep experts in the field. So um, thank you very much for uh, coming and thank everybody for uh, showing their interest. And I'm gonna go on mute now and leave it to these two experts. Well, thank you, Bill. Wow, um, Pam, the heat is on now. We're uh... We've been elevated to statuses we didn't seek, but <laughs> thank you, Paul. So welcome everybody. I'm Sonia. And I'm Pam. We're uh, thrilled to have you here tonight. Um, hopefully you're nice and warm and toasty and, um, and comfortable. We're going to, let's see, what is the time? Uh, yeah, people, I wonder if we'll have any more that'll come in a little late. We're about four minutes past the hour. We'll start with a slow introduction. Um, so we're planning to go on for about half an hour and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we'll, uh, as um, as um, Michael asked that, uh, please leave, and, and, and um, Bill, please leave your questions for the end. You'll probably find some of them answered during the, the presentation as well. Um, and certainly put them in the chat and, um, Michael from Sustainable Warwick is going to very kindly be um, watching those for us. Um, so one thing I'd like you guys to, to do to put in your chat box is how you heard about this webinar and where you're located, where you're from, just so we know who our audience is and um, where to direct our outreach in future as well. Um, so um, we're um, so uh, a little bit about me and 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 Pam will introduce herself and then we'll tell you a little bit about sustainable Warwick. Um, I um, I certainly don't consider myself an expert. Let me put it out there. I've I've um, gleaned my expertise um, of planting native seeds from people who are far more expert than me. And I, uh, you know, I'm grateful for them, to them forever about this. Um, it really is something that's better shown you than read about because there's all sorts of little things. It's like starting a, a, a fire without matches. There's always those tiny little tips and tricks that catch you and the thing never works until somebody who's uh, managed to succeed shows you. Um, so I'm hoping this will help do that for you. Um, I, um, I have a background in ecology, so I view things from the point of view of observing nature. What does nature do when it's at its natural state, the state it should be in? That can teach you a lot about what to do next with your seeds, whatever you're doing. Um, I used to be a master gardener at Rockland um, County, and I see some of my master gardener friends on on tonight, welcome. And um, I mainly did that so I could stop killing plants. Um, and that worked kind of mostly. We, we all killed our hundreds, of course, uh, as any gardener knows. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this will be a really useful se um, session for you. And over to you, Pam, do you want to? Yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Pam Goldman, and uh, my background is also in ecology, um, more from a wildlife standpoint. Um, and uh, oh, there we go. Uh, so it, yeah, more of a wildlife uh, background. 
and my interest in native plants began about 20 years ago, more from a, a standpoint of what um, the relationship of native plants with wildlife. Um, so, and I'm also, I am a um, uh, Orange County master gardener. Um, and um, I started, I planted my first native plant after going to a lecture. Um, about 20 years ago, and I planted one in my garden, uh, and I noticed that uh, my garden had been, my flowers had been impatience and marigolds and petunias and gladiolas and those kind of things, and, and they're pretty, um, but after I planted my first native plant, I noticed different kinds of bees were coming into my garden, um, and that was intriguing. Uh, then I started adding a few more, uh, every year, maybe one or two more. And it was really uh, impressed me that there were so many new bees and butterflies and different kinds of beetles and hummingbirds were showing up. So um, it just really increased the um, biodiversity just in my own little backyard. Um, I was, it was difficult 20 years ago to find places where you could buy native plants. I started buying seeds and growing my own. And then um, that kind of snowballed into growing plants um, for other people and helping people with gardens, which eventually became a, a small business. So I do um, uh, grow native plants a limited amount um, for, for planting for myself and sometimes for selling. So, um, over the years though, I also have learned a lot from people who are all doing this before me um, and um, getting lots of good tips from them. So um, we're, again, really happy to share anything that, any experience I have that I can help you um, and uh, maybe help you avoid some of the pitfalls because <laughs> I've had a few. <laughs> Yeah, indeed we have. So um, just so you guys know, for those, for those folks who are not familiar with Sustainable War Week, um, just wanted to let you know a little bit about them. Uh, they're a dynamic group of people um, who work to increase public understanding of sustainability by providing information and encouraging individuals, as well as organizations, businesses, schools, and governments to cooperate in protecting environmental quality and reducing carbon emissions. And also uh, grow, grow Greenwood Lake, Grow Local Greenwood Lake is, uh, is, is part of this um, effort. And their aim is to create a sustainable, re resilient local food system to enhance the environmental and social health of Greenwood Lake and the surrounding community. Um, in particular, this presentation is under the auspices of a, of a subcommittee of um, Sustainable War Week called the Pollinator Pathway of War Week. We're going to provide um, um, links at the end of this presentation to find out more there. Um, the Pollinator Pathway movement is has got a phenomenal amount of information as, as does um, Sustainable War Week on various environmental things. But uh, the Pollinator Pathways, for those of you who don't know about them, is a partnership of public and private properties to create protected corridors of particularly native plants because they provide nutrition and habitats for pollinators, mainly insects and birds. Um, and even small spaces like window boxes and, and curb strips can be part of the pathway. You don't have to own 50 acres to, to make it. Um, so we're encouraging uh, in one week to people to incorporate native plants in their gardens and even turn potentially useful um, lawn areas into flower meadows as well where they can, where it's feasible. Um, just another thing I needed to mention before we launch is that, um, oh, restrooms are on your right. Wait, what? I'm just checking that you're listening. And um, we, yeah, we, we are recording this, of course, for those of you coming late. So if you miss anything, um, it will be on the Sustainable War Week site. Um, I, I don't know if we're actually going to be sending out an email with a recording URL, but um, I'll leave that to, oh, I have a definite yes. Okay, so if it's signed up, we'll get a, we'll get a little present in the in, email inbox. So um, with, without further ado, before you fall asleep, what is a native anyway? Um, 
So a native, oh, sorry, I just went, I'm trying to get rid of something on my screen here. But yeah, what is a native? Um, basically, um, and, and please uh, jump in uh, Pam anytime. It's, it's something, it's a plant that's home continent is North America, in particular the US and more locally and specifically the Northeast region of the United States. You can go even more local than that, you know, by degrees, you know, toward to the this sub region to um, Orange County and surrounds um, Vernon maybe as well um, and so forth. Um, for our purposes, I'm looking at Northeast, uh, Northeastern um, USA um, as a sort of a general big swath of native of plants that have existed there since the last um, uh, ice age, you know, long before us white people came and changed things around. Um, so, and, and these are the kind of plants um, that tend to get turfed out when there's a new development and so forth. So um, usually um, a lot of them are, are covered with weeds from Eurasia as well. We humans are tremendously good vectors at transporting all these things all over the world. But, um, so, so the, the natives um, that we're talking about um, are those that have a specific function in nature. You know, you may be wondering, well, you know, um, so, so what? I've got, I've got a great garden, I've got beautiful flowers, and that's great, you know. But um, many of them haven't co-evolved with the insects specifically that are native to North America. And they've developed... Um, um, chemicals that our insects haven't adapted to. So um, they, they can't survive off them. They, they larvae die if they try to eat any parts of them. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all very well having flowers for pollinators, like those bees on that uh, milkweed there. But, um, you know, you cannot live on sugar alone. Um, you need good solid protein to feed your babies, pretty much. Um, and that's what uh, young, um, young, um, um, larvae and caterpillars and things like that of insects depend on to grow. They need plant parts to munch on um, that they are not allergic to or poisoned by. Um, and often some of them have very specific um, relationships with only a few species or maybe even one species. And if that goes, they go. Um, they can't survive otherwise. It's like the monarch and the milkweed. The monarch has been um, adapting, growing, growing with the wolf milkweed for thousands, if not millions of years. Um, and without uh, milkweed, their, their caterpillar will die. So um, that's why we grow them. Um, and furthermore, you know, in the, in the bigger food web, birds in the same way depend on insects. And especially in spring, um, they, they, they depend on hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars um, to feed, to stuff into their mouths of their young who need to grow really quickly before a predator finds them and replenish the population. You know, they, they don't have, um, you know, medical insurance like we do or medical care or, or safe houses from predators. So they have to repopulate every year to, to keep their populations from sinking. Um, you know, Doug Tallamy, who I quoted at the bottom, he's got a wonderful, wonderful, webinar that he's done um, um, exploring this topic. It's a really fascinating one and I've got the link at the bottom as well. I really recommend you watch it. That's very, very watchable. Um, and also another thing about natives is they are adapted to these conditions. A lot of hybrid uh, fancy plants from um, nurseries and imported plants need a little bit of babying, if not a lot of babying. Some of them need to be actually dug up and put inside or something like that for the winter because they won't survive. Whereas natives, you can just leave them and they'll hunker down and come back every year. So um, that's kind of the neat thing. It's lazy man's gardening, which is my kind of gardening. Anything to, any thoughts there, Pam? Oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so over to you, Pam. Okay. You want to explain something sure. that's key to our talk today. Sure. Um, so I, I think I'll start out here with um, just germination. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows some of the terminology we'll be using. So, um, so uh, germination is uh, the process where 
the seedlings come out of the seed. Um, and most of them, it's, it's after a time of dormancy. And here in New York, um, our seeds stay dormant all winter, or at least the coal months, probably from when they're, when they're dropping to the ground in October, November, through to um, springtime. And they have this dormancy, it's like a safety factor that keeps them from germinating um, in the middle of winter. Say if you get a warm week in February, um, the seeds won't, won't germinate yet. This, the seeds won't sprout yet because if they did, well, there's gonna be cold weather following that. Um, so the seeds, the plants that, that produce seeds um, in this area, um, they, their seeds are protected um, to not germinate until it's optimal for that seed. And, uh, and some seeds will germinate really early in cooler weather. Some will require a more consistent warm temperature. Others will maybe not germinate until the summer. So different seeds, different plants have different germination times. Um, or, or um, yeah, germination times. Um, so um, stratification or cold moist stratification is um, kind of the process that happens to these seeds. And again, here our native plants um, in New York are requiring some of, most of them need about 30 to 60 days of cold stratification, which just means a cold moist condition. And by cold, we mean um, usually not over 40 degrees um, at night in colder nights. So the picture here just shows some pots with snow on them. And um, that's exactly what our native seeds need. They need this moist, cold stratification that breaks down uh, that, that um, seed coat um, and, over, and over time um, makes those seeds ready to germinate when the conditions are, are optimal for them. Um, and we can do this, this cold stratification. Okay. Sometimes I use a refrigerator to do it with my flats, which we'll show you some of those. Um, but honestly, the best, the easiest and best way to do this is um, just the way mother nature does is to do this outdoors. And um, you don't need to use a refrigerator. You don't, these seeds are programmed to sprout when the conditions are ready. So if you plant them, put them outdoors um, and let nature take its course. So um, we're talking today about planting these seeds in pots or flats or some kind of containers. Um, and the question a lot of people have is, why don't you just sow them directly on the ground? And you can do that. But when you do that, um, a lot of these seeds will um, be you know, blown away, eaten by birds, eaten by mice. Um, when they start to um, develop, they may be overcome by weeds and things. So if you're really um, wanting to grow plants, you um, are gonna need to protect them a little bit. So you can sow directly, but you're not going to get as many plants, not nearly as many plants as if you plant them and kind of watch over them, take care of them a little bit. So this is one of the things, you know, growing native seeds involves, um, it, it involves some, some care, but um, it's a fun process to um, be part of. It's a um, fun process to watch. And it's very rewarding when um, you get these plants planted in the ground and um, you see how much they're increasing the biodiversity of your area. So. Right, yeah, so, so that's why we're going to be having you uh, plant your seeds now in the deepest, darkest, coldest part of winter and the coldest, longest winter that uh, I've observed in the 20 years I've been in New York. Um, so that's because this is what your, your plants want you to do. Um, so, Finally, how do you do it? We finally got to the meat, haven't we? Um, Pam, um, do you want to take it away? Oh, <laughs> sure. Um, sure. Well, uh, so you can um, 
for your your planting materials um, you can use many different things you can use these flats here in the picture um, but every, any any container you use for planting your seeds should have drainage um, they, they absolutely need to have drainage because they need some moisture some moist soil but they um, they if there's too wet, the seeds will rot. So um, uh, make sure you have drainage holes, but you could use trays like in the picture, um, pots, um, uh, food trays, you know, like the clamshells you get your, your might be getting your lettuces in, um, you, Chinese uh, food uh, that you get your food, your Chinese food in, uh, everything, anything will work like that. Um, just drill some holes or make some holes for drainage. So you can get also the little um, trays that you'll see in probably the next slide, um, individual little sections. Some of them are 50 or 72. You can buy them at um, the, the hardware stores or the plant stores. So it's kind of up to you how you want to do that. Um, you can use um, two by two, three by three inch square pots. Um, and some things, some of these pots are a little easier in, in one way or a little, little more difficult in others. Um, so we'll show you some of those pots, but um, Sonia, did you wanna talk about your, um, your storage? Yeah, in a secchi. So I, I found this old, I rescued this old pretzel mega bin at work. And you can, what you can do is you can just cut around it and, you, you know, if you're into recycling as much as I am, um, you know, you can cut it and poke a few holes in it and there you have a little ready-made container as well. You don't have to go to the expense of buying these, um, these flats, um, but you can also raid your, with their permission, raid your neighbor's woodshed and find a whole bunch of these doomed uh, to dust in there, especially if you see your neighbor's, um, you know, vegetable garden has kind of grown weedy and uncared for over the last two years since they discovered how much work it is. They'll probably be glad to get rid of all the old containers and give them to you. But you need to sterilize them uh, in a little bit of bleach and air dry because fungi is a problem. Fungi will take out your seeds and your seedlings um, so um, and bacteria. So you wanna just wash them out really well. Um, anything that you use. In fact, uh, we're dealing with baby plants, so their the immune systems aren't uh, strong enough yet, so we need to help them. Um, and um, you want to also um, have a place to put them away from mice and rats uh, and voles. I had voles break into mine the other uh, last winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and anything else that's really hungry right now this year and they don't have uh, permission to go into the supermarkets and get food. So they'll come to your, um, whatever you have in your sheds. Um, and then you're going to, and then we'll go into this a little bit more. You're gonna fill these with soil and you're going to store them outside in a sheltered place like an unheated garage or woodshed or unheated basement or a bin. And um, something like this. So I go. I, I I'm I'm restoring a 150 acre property. So I have a lot of plantings to do. So I go big scale like this. I just plant out hundreds of these uh, flats. Uh, put them in a bin that size, and they're freezing freezing nicely in the winter in the winter until um, about sometime in April. Um, and that you can use as well, any old furniture sort of storage containers and some stuff outside. If you can get it as mouse proof as possible, that's great. Otherwise, um, Pam has got uh, on, on the on the picture on the left is her idea. Do you want to talk about that a little, Pam? Sure, sure. So I don't plant as many flats as Sonia does, um, but I do probably raise a about a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred seedlings in a season. So um, I, I tend to use this um, uh, this wooden frame uh, with uh, the metal uh, mesh across the top. Um, hardware cloth, I think it might be called, either a quarter inch to a half inch. That will keep um, any mice, or any rodents. Uh, 
or birds getting in to eat the seeds. And right in this picture here, you see this, is, this would be more of the springtime. I don't have a picture of winter with snow on it or anything, but the idea is to, um, to have some kind of a base, don't have it right on the ground because if it's on the ground, voles can dig up underneath um, and slugs and things can get up in there. I, a few years ago, had voles get into where I had a bed um, of pots of second year um, echinacea or purple coneflower. Um, probably had a couple dozen pots that it was overwintering for the next spring uh, to sell as two year plants. And um, in the spring, when I went into that area to, un to pull the pots out uh, and cover them and check them, the stems were all standing up in their pots. But when I lifted, pulled on the stem, they came right out and there was just a big hole that you could look down into the soil. The voles had chewed through the bottom of the pots and went up and eaten all the uh, um, roots out of the echinacea. So um, that, that was a lot of work that <laughs> went into vole food. Um, so it's really, it is important to protect these, uh, these little seeds and seedlings. And so this wooden frame can be built quite easily. Um, it's just two by four. You can use a little bit um, larger board. You can place these on bricks like this or gravel. Um, you can place them um, in your unheated garage. You do want it unheated um, so that it, it remains cold all winter. Um, uh, and you also want to keep that mouse proof. You don't want to make sure it's, it's mouse proof. Or you can put it outside um, on your driveway, um, on your deck, um, close to the house, gives it a little bit of shelter. And um, you don't want to put it under like the edge of your roof so that you don't get a downpour, um, which would kind of wash all the, the soil and the seeds um, away. Uh, but if you put it in a, just a protected area, oh, sometimes I put mine under my picnic tables. Um, one time we put them, we knew that our kids were older, they weren't going to use a trampoline, so I used the trampoline, put them underneath there, just a protected spot where they're kind of kept, um, dark, you know, kind of dark and um, protected. But anyhow, this is, um, this is one of the seed boxes that will be used this year. This is a little bit taller, probably about a six inch board, if you can see that. And on the top is the screen that's just stapled on there. And this goes over um, a standard flat, or you can just put a whole bunch of uh, pots in there, different sizes, like is in the picture. And they're easy to make. You can also make them larger. I like the smaller ones or just maybe double that size because they're easier to move around and to find little places here and there where you can tuck them in. And uh, if you do this now, um, or if you've done it in December, um, the plants just stay like that. They get um, rained on, they get snowed on. Um, the snow is wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful protective blanket for all these little seeds. And um, you might want to put a brick or two on, on the corners, um, depending upon how heavy it is, so it doesn't get blown away. But um, that works really well. And then in the the um, in the springtime, say, I, I guess we'll talk about this in the next slide. But um, it's also um, easy to move that around a little bit in the springtime um, into a sunnier location when when they're ready. So. Um, yeah. So one thing while we're on the slide, um, you may oh. notice our little white tags. That's um, we cannot stress how important it is to label your parts. There's nothing like looking at something wondering, is there something in there? What is it? Where does it go? Because little baby plants often don't look like their adult selves yet for quite, quite some time. So you don't want to put something that needs a wetland into a dry spot or something like that. And in addition, in case these tags pop out, I on my on the sides of my flats, I put masking tape and I write the name of the plant there as well as insurance. This is all born out of bitter experience, of course. Yeah. Can I share my experience? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you can see um, 
these tags, here we go. So these are plastic, you can buy them. You can use wooden, um, wooden like uh, um, craft sticks or uh, popsicle sticks. Um, you can take milk jugs and just cut strips of milk jugs and write on them. Um, so writing on them, if you use a paint marker or um, a garden marker, um, it's a good investment. Well, the first year I used a Sharpie marker and Sharpie fades as soon as the sunlight gets on it. I started out in the fall putting all new markers in my plants that were overwintering. And uh, the next spring, I had no idea because it had all faded off totally. So, um, and it really is hard to know if you think you, oh, you think you know what, what's in there, or you think you know what's in your flat, but if uh, also if this tag is pulled out or falls out accidentally, as Sonia said, it's really nice to have uh, your tray um, or the individual pot marked with what's in there as well, because that, you know, should stay with the pot or the tray, whereas these tags sometimes fall out. But um, definitely, I mean, I've been known to spend a lot of time raising something that ended up being a weed, just because I thought that it probably was one of my plants, so. Yeah, nothing quite as annoying as that, oh. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, label, label. Yeah, can't stress it enough. Okay, so what do you do when you sow them? So I actually filled one of my flats with growing compound. I'm actually going to move my screen a little down so you can see them. Okay. And I pulled it to the top and then I pressed it down some more because it slumps often. And, you know, you only have about two, if you're lucky, two and a half, three inches of soil here. You want to give their roots as much opportunity to um establish as they can so the more soil the better um, it always slumps down if you don't push it press it the other important thing i did was i moistened the soil so it's like you know it's like a sponge you can see it holds its texture when you uh, a little bit and crumbles a little um, that's kind of ideal for the seeds and then you have different types of seed sizes let me get a piece of paper to put it on the back so you can actually see. Um, so here I've got some uh, Black Eyed Susan seeds. So they're fairly, fairly big um, and easy to see. Then you have something like this, these fuzzy aster seeds, which are a lot smaller. They've got all this fluff to help blow them through the air away from the parent plant. And these little tiny black stripes here on the paper, I don't know if you can see them, are what's left, or what's the actual seed, not the, not the parachute. And then you have absolutely tiny, tiny little seeds in here. Can you see that? They're, they're, they're smaller than poppy seeds. Um, so um, a, a lovely plant called penstemon, which we recommend everybody have uh, in their gardens, is as small as this. So there's different ways of, of sowing these. Um, you know, normally we just draw a stripe or press a line um, through the through the flats and then sew them in there. And that you can do with these big ones easily. And you can actually see where they are. And I would sew them fairly close to each other, you know. Um, so I would take this bunch and just sprinkle away. Okay, some of them will be touching, it doesn't matter. The thing is, not every seed is guaranteed to germinate. There are a whole lot of factors are in its development that may prohibit it. But um, you know you can sow them fairly thickly. Why do I, I create a line? It's just so that when they when they grow up I know more or less, oh I put my seeds in line so whatever grows out of that may and it looks different is probably a weed and I can pull it out while it's small. And then you just lightly brush the soil over to cover them slightly and pat it down. These little hairy things are really hard to, to um, sew. And because they're so teeny tiny, we actually just sew them on the surface. You know, you probably, hopefully you can see um, them against the dark there. And um, I'm spreading them out a little bit, but I can't unclump them all. And that doesn't matter. We're going to, we're going to be talking about that soon. 
And these you would just press down so that they have contact with the soil and then the next little breeze doesn't blow them away. And then these tiny little ones, you would also just um, do a little line of them and just gently sow them fairly thickly there. Um, you, can, you can spread them out a little bit if you feel there, there are some that are too close. And again, you tamp them down. And then you take a little watering can and we recommend you have one with a sprinkle nozzle, not a single nozzle, and you water them. I don't know if I should even dare do it here with my little watering can. It's not a sprinkle nozzle, but it's very tiny. So, you know, you would, you would um, water all of this until the water comes out at the bottom. So it's well saturated. And then you would take it as is into cold storage for the winter. And that's planting in a, in a sum. Why are you, oh, here we go, red beard. Um, and then when they come out in, um, in the spring, you'll see like the tray at the bottom there, you'll see tiny little, uh, on, on the, sorry, the, the tray on the left here, tiny little green flecks, you know, they come out all over the place. And the same, uh, um, Pam has pot, do you wanna talk about the pots that you put there, Pam? Sure. So for some reason, I'm not seeing the screen now. I'm just oh, you're not. Yeah. Um, I, I stopped the sharing so that I thought people could see the C display better. Oh, I, oh I'm sorry. I, I right. hope I did that early that's enough. That's perfect. Yeah, no, that's great. That's fine. But do you want to restore the string carriage? Then go ahead. Um, or if yes. you want to say something. Yeah, you go. Do you want to... Um, do you want to go for it, Pam? Can you see it? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, do I need to reshare, Mike? Maybe. Sorry. Every you time need to reshare again. Okay. Every time I hit the hit anything with my mouse, it, it advances the slides. So bear with me, people. I haven't done this for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, where are, where are we? Um, okay, reshare. Okay, maybe X and then let's uh, eliminate this, make it larger. Um, here we go, share screen. Okay, share, that should come back. All right, and let's continue with the slideshow. Here we go. Wonderful. Can you see? All right, is, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, Okay, so uh, when it's time to take your pots or your trays out, um, when they've had their cold moist stratification period, and usually early April, mid April, um, some, some species like columbine really like a cool weather um, for, for germinating. Um, many other seeds require it to be a little warmer. Um, but anyhow, so early mid April, if you, when you take your trays out, um, you are going to put them into a semi-sunny place. Um, morning sun in the spring is okay, um, afternoon shade. If you have um, some dappled sunlight, maybe from a, a tree or, or an area in your yard that's more dappled, um, it's good to put them in morning sun or dappled sunlight to begin with because um, as these seeds germinate, they're tiny little seeds with tiny little roots, uh, very tender little stems and leaves. Um, and if your soil dries out um, because they've been out in the sun all day, um, you're, because those roots are so tiny that they'll just dry up. And sometimes just within a day, if it ends up being a really hot, say May um, afternoon, very sunny and it gets hot in the seventies, um, that's really stressful for those little seedlings. So um, again, afternoon shade, and once they get larger, uh, maybe uh, three, three or four sets of um, true leaves, then you can start pushing them out into sunny areas a, a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more sunny. But the, one of the really important things is check them 
a couple times a day, you know, in the morning before you go to work, as soon as you get home, make sure they're not drying out. You probably need to water, water, water them. Um, these are, you see the little baby there. These are babies and you really need to check on them and make sure they have everything they need. Um, so anything yeah. else, Sonia? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you think of it, they are so small and they were these teeny tiny roots that um, occupy only the first few millimeters of soil and always when the weather dries out those are the first that's the first layer to dry they just don't have enough body on them to con to hold on to water um, enough like a, a fully developed plant has and um so they you know they will they will be the first to die that you know uh, just like a seed is almost like a time capsule. It's almost bomb proof. It's there to protect the embryo before it gets planted through anything. You know, it even needs a winter stratification. When it emerges and, and it's that tiny, a little seedling is one of the most vulnerable um, little things, uh, little life forms on earth, just like a baby bird or even a little baby human. They need fussing over all the time. Um, and that's usually the reason majority of, people's seedlings die at least I found with, with me is um, you know if they don't if aside from not having good drainage if they've got good drainage and everything else is perfect well they um, they don't they don't have consistent water so the so the idea is to have it uh, as often enough so you need to actually set a schedule on your calendar or reminders um, just like you would feed a baby human every few hours, you don't have to go and water your plant every few hours, but I'd have, I check it every day, especially if it's in a dry environment um, or the sun might fall on it at some point, um, just to make sure. And then you can sort of, uh, it's every few days and then every, every week. And then, you know, you space out the time longer as it grows bigger. And of course, any, any dry or adverse weather immediately go and check up on them as well. Um, there was one thing I wanted to say about that as well. Um, um, if you, if you, if a lot of people think, well, like, well, why don't you just put it in the ground and be done with all this fussing? And you, absolutely, you can do that. You need to make sure you stamp them in the ground so that there's good contact. And you need to make sure that they are not big, powerful plants that are going to grow like gangbusters and overcrowd them and then just kill them through sheer competition later on as well, that they have enough room. So weeding may be an issue. But the main thing is the vicissitude of the outdoor soil. You might not be out there monitoring it as well as you would your flats, which are within easy reach uh, usually for you. Um, and uh, then it's sort of left to the mercies of the weather. The soil of the ground also harbors a lot of pathogens, fungus and stuff. And that's why we also recommend when you buy soil for your seedlings, get something called seedling soil. It's normally been sterilized so that there's minimum fungal, well, deleterious fungi. There are very good fungi called mycorrhizae, which you do want to keep in the soil, but you don't want those that will sort of eat baby plants for you. Um, and um, for those of you also who don't have space, you know, what do I do? You know, I, I don't have room for all these flats. I don't have anywhere. What I did last year with, with my plants was I used Ziploc bags and I stuck them in the fridge. So what I did, I put some soil in there. The soil is very dry out here. So in fact, you know, that's one of the reasons you wanna, uh, you wanna uh, water it because it sort of comes out and makes you sneeze. Um, I put in, I mixed in my, uh, these, these I had pen stem and seedlings in there. I just put a painter's tape on and, and labeled them. And then I watered them until they were about the same consistency as the soil you just saw in that flat, you know, just a little bit at a time, let it mix through, mush it, you don't want it to be too wet. And then I put them all in the fridge or vegetable drawer or whatever um, for the rest of winter until it was ready to go and plant them in the spring. Um, I didn't plant them in the ground. I, I did plant them in pots and things first as well because I wanted to ensure maximum success. So I had good seedling soil and I watched them like a hawk. So now the soil is kind of just, just about perfect. 
Um, so those are those questions. Um, if you have more about this, absolutely, we welcome them. Um, also, when you water your, your, your pots with seedlings in there, don't just water the first few millimeters. Make sure that the whole, it goes right through the whole soil as well. Give it a good drenching um, because those things are growing roots. And if the water's only around here, the roots are gonna just stay up at the surface. You want them to grow big and deep. And also one of the reasons why we recommend you make your soil wet before you put your seedlings in is when soil is super dry, so powder dry that will sort of um, just float around in the air, it becomes uh, uh, um, hydrophobic. In other words, it, it cannot, it's not just scared of water really, it's, it doesn't wanna um, attach to water. And, what, and that's why you find some of you, like your house plants, if you've forgotten to water them and they, very light and bone dry. If you if you water them, the water just runs right through instead of soaking into the soil. It's because it's going through the cracks on the sides of the of the pot um, and just running through instead of attaching to the soil. And you have to pretty much um, sit it in a bucket of water or something to let it soak in. Um, with these pots as well, I found that if I didn't if if I used bone dry soil and I just watered water them as as I thought I would, you know, I, I'd soak it good. And then I'd scratch the surface, maybe, you know, just up to the first knuckle and it would be bone dry. Um, so, um, you know, all underneath it, uh, underneath that top wet surface, the, the soil refused to bond. So um, what happens then is later on, it's gonna keep doing that. You know, you're gonna be watering your plants and thinking you're giving them a good watering and, um, it's not saturating all the soil. And that's another reason why sometimes seedlings don't make it because all those tiny little factors, you know, you've got to, there's a reason why they say deep, deep watering and all that. Um, okay, um, let's see, what, have, what else have we got for you? Oh yes, I'm to grow to the nursery stage. Pam, you want to take this away or do you want me to keep droning on? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so so time to graduate from the from the crest to the nursery. I call it from the flats where they're all growing in a large group, and to have their own little beds, their own little space. Um, so when your when your seedlings um, get to be a couple of inches tall, normally uh, before they start getting leggy, you'll find they're all um, growing in little bunches along along your seed tray and you're gonna separate them. Um, if you can't separate them, you may have to kill a couple and just keep the one. <laughs> um, and yes, it's, it's gonna hurt, but you'll get over it. I, you can, there, there might even be grief counseling in there for you at some point, but um, you, you certainly want to separate them so that they don't intertwine their roots because plants don't do well in such close competition. One of them dies eventually and there'll be a lot of slow death unfortunately for it. So um, you're gonna, you're gonna what we call prick them out, um, you know, either take a little spatula or, a, you know, an old emery board or something and lift them out and put them into their own pots. Again, I use good seedling soil, clean soil, because they're still very young and tender at the stage. There's another great opportunity to use all those impatience pots you've got stacked up. I know you have in the back of your wood chip. And um, then um, again, label, don't forget to label what you have um, and keep watering them, keep looking after them. Um, this will be sometime a few weeks after you've put your, your flats out in the ground for, out in the, um, in the open, uh, in the sunshine for your uh, seedling to start, start growing. Um, and uh, when, you, when these eventually grow bigger, like the picture on the right there, those, are, those look about, Pam, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they look almost ready to go into the ground. They're looking rather robust. They're taking on the shape that they eventually will have. Yes, that's um, butterfly weed, um, milkweed, and those are about probably about three months old, two and a half, three months old. And yes, those would be ready to go into the ground. Great, yeah. And those are pure pleasure to plant because it just takes a little trowel and that's it. And it takes off beautifully. And, and from that, you should have a lot of success. Um, 
what else we got for you? Yeah, protection water, just a reminder. Um, um, use those cages still, even on the ones in the single pots, if you can, or have a protected area from hungry, um, cute little furry things in the garden. Um, oh yes, we I went ahead of us. I apologize. So, you know, for those who don't have storage space, you can use the blocks of soil. But um, if you don't want to have soil, you don't like the idea of soil in your fridge. Um, Pam has actually a very good idea there. Uh, so yeah, what you can do to cold stratify, even say um, you wish you had stratified seeds that require sixty days of cold stratification but it's now March and you don't have 60 days outside, then you can just um, do something like this, which is take a coffee filter and moisten it, um, sprinkle your seeds on the coffee filter and then fold it. I fold them in quarters and put them in a Ziploc bag. Um, again, labeling it with the date and um, the, uh, the, the type of seed there is. And you can put that in your refrigerator in your crisper drawer. You could you could do many many you know um, uh, bags at a time, and it won't take up much room. With the this uh, method, you want to check your um, your coffee filters um, every at least every month to make sure they're not drying out. You might need to just moist them a little bit more. You don't want them to be too wet. If you have actually standing water in the bag, that's too much. But um, also check your seeds, you can unfold it. If you have anything that's getting moldy, you could remove uh, the, any moldy seed. But um, if you have any seeds that are sprouting, you do need to take those off the uh, paper and plant them because once they start sprouting, they really should be put into the soil. Uh, but that's another way of cold stratification. Um, the nodding onions, the seeds are big enough to see. Um, the great blue lobelia, that's almost a dust-like seed. So it's very, um, it's very you know, hard to, to see those. Um, and so on a, on a nice white um, coffee filter, that can work pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I, I bet, um, Pam, I bet folks are wondering at this stage, why do we keep on insisting on the Goldilocks zone where it's got to be not too wet and not too dry, but just oh. right. So what's what's the idea behind that? Are we just being pedantic? Uh, no, it, you know, we're just trying to mimic what um, Mother Nature would have for them. And, um, you know, when you're when you're talking about a lot of soil and the rain, you know, the soil soaks the rain soaks in here we're just trying to keep the right amount of water you know you don't want them to rot you don't want them to dry out and it's easy to happen in a, a very small area like that so right so so what happens when it's too dry uh, when there's a stronger medium that wicks or uh, moisture like paper or dry soil for that matter um it can, you know, just because a seed looks dry on the outside, it doesn't mean it's totally dry on the inside. It's got a living embryo in a little plant cell. And um, that needs uh, a certain amount of moisture and therefore cellular processes so it can start growing. And even that can be sometimes wicked out of it uh, by if the environment is so dry. Um, mm -hmm. Normally seeds can, can, can hold onto it, but if you've got them in this stage when they're uh, the, the stratification is starting to crack their seed coats. You don't want to lose that moisture. And why have you labeled yours, Pam? What's the idea behind that? Because it's really hard to know what's in there if you don't label it. Um, I mean, I mean the date, sorry. Oh, the date. Well, that's how I know um, grape blue lobelia needs 60 days of cold stratification. So I know that that'll be ready 60 days from the date that that was put in that bag. Um, okay. So, and nodding onion, you know, each of them, um, if you could also write the num number of days that they need to be cold stratified. Um, these were all going to be taken out at the same time. So I didn't add that on the baggie, but you could do that. Great, no, that's all very helpful. Good reminders. Um, yeah, so where do you get seeds from? Um, if you haven't already, run to the display at Warwick Library before they're all gone. Um, Pam and I harvested um, our wild seeds and stuffed them into little coin, 
Bitcoin pouches for you. So you can uh, have fun putting all this into practice and watch your bounty develop. Um, unlike um, unlike uh, vegetable seeds, which have been prepped uh, by the seed companies, uh, our natives will need what, what we've just been telling you to do to, to grow. So hopefully you'll, you'll kind of enjoy that. You've got a few other um, sources there I see, um, Pam. Sure. Um, so the Wild Seed Project, uh, well, Prairie Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery are good sources of native seed. Um, their native seed can come from probably the Midwest and the Northeast, uh, but they are, have good information there. And you can you will see this the um, the the seed code. Um, you can look up your plant by common name or um, uh, scientific name, and they'll tell you all kinds of information about what kind of soil, um, water, uh, moisture, and sunlight requirements that, that plant will have. It also tells you the seed um, germination code. And different companies use different codes, so you have to kind of be careful. But um, if it says C30, it means cold stratification for 30 days. And they'll, they'll give you the codes and they'll also give you a chart as to what the, um, the codes mean. Um, so just you know, look, at, look at that. You can easily tell um, whether you're harvesting your own seed or you're buying seed from them. Wild Seed Project, um, they are in Maine. Uh, they are also um, supply seed. They don't have as much available so they can run out um, quicker than, than the Prairie Moon or Prairie Nursery. But um, it's a great source of seed. It's, it is Northeastern um, seed. So uh, it's probably closer or, or you can rely on it being kind of closer to uh, that, the uh, climate that we have here in New York. Um, and also if you go to Wild Seed Project and click on learn, um, you can find uh, kind of the, the same um, information of how to start um, cold stratification uh, and winter sowing of seeds. So you can see that in a, a, a printed form. So, yeah, step-by-step um, -step pictures like a recipe. Right, yeah. <laughs> if I may add in there before we leave, there's also, there are local nurseries that do, um, more local nurseries that sell seeds. Um, one of them is attached to um, the New Jersey Plant um, Society, I think it is, uh, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Um, that's the third one from the top. Um, the, I think one of their the members owns Toad Shade Farm in, in New Jersey. You can actually um, probably go there with appointments. I'm not sure what COVID protocol is, but she sells loads of seeds as well. And there are many other noble uh, local efforts coming up everywhere. You could probably just Google the great uh, search engine uh, uh, slash encyclopedia of our time. Um, the YouTube for um, Doug Tallamy, as all URLs are, is in, in, incoherent. Um, so the best you can do is just type YouTube Nature's Best Hope and you can add Doug Tallamy for insurance. You'll see several versions of it coming up. They will pretty much cover the same. They're just hosted by different um, groups. Um, and of course, do check out Sustainable Warwick and the Pollinator Pathway. Lots to learn and see. Anything else to, any other thoughts to add before we move to questions? Um, I think that's good. Good, okay, satisfied. Okay, well, thank you so much for holding with much longer than a half an hour this talk. We started a little late as well, but um, well done to you who are still here and still awake. And um, so we're going to be taking questions now and Mike, Michael has very kindly offered to steer those for us. Over to you, Michael. Okay, let's see. One of the questions I see here, Brian is asking the question, how do you prevent mold when cold stratifying on a coffee filter or paper towel or whatever? That's a Pam question, I think. Uh, so coffee filters are pretty sterile and you're you know, probably using water that's fairly sterile tap water. 
uh, you, you can get mold in the, and the seeds are usually pretty clean. You could actually um, rinse them, put them in uh, some water, slosh them around, and then pour it through the coffee filter so that you don't lose your seeds. But uh, I don't have a whole lot of problems with mold, especially if you're checking it periodically and you see one get moldy, you can just pick it off. Um, and uh, and when mold, usually it, it doesn't show up if it does until after the first month or so, and that's getting close to the time that you would be planting them. So again, I, I haven't had a whole lot of problem with mold doing that. Yeah, I, I guess just make sure your fridge is always running or you don't take them out and leave them out for any particular time. You wanna keep the temperature consistent. Mm -hmm. I would add. Right. Good question. Um, we had a couple people who really liked the elephant watering can. I'm going to pass that <laughs> along. But before Brian second had another question about what you think about starting <laughs> seeds in soil blocks. What do you think, Sonia? I have not tried that. Um, I heard that's a great method. I'm. I don't know. Uh, I'm hesitant to try it. I always imagine they're going to break apart for some reason, but maybe they have a, the soil has a high enough clay content to hold them together. Uh, I've not actually explored that. It's a great question. That's a good one for the University of Google, possibly. I feel the same way. I haven't tried it, but it, it seems it's interesting. Yeah. Well, we have a Sarah uh, is a so soil block expert. So. Uh... Oh, great. She, she runs the uh, community garden in the Warwick community garden. She does a lot of soil blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a that's a good uh, place to get onto the um, community garden Zoom Zoom group and uh, get all that intel from there. So, you know, um, that's a really good question using alternative methods. Um, I've had people asking me about cow pots or make your own little pots out of folded newspaper, very craftily done and other things. Those are all good methods, absolutely. They have their pros and cons, of course. You know, newspapers, of course, the most fragile, especially when it gets wet, you know, so it might fall apart on you sooner. Uh, cow pots are fantastic because you just put the whole thing, the whole little plug plant um, into the ground with it and you don't have to take it out of the pot. Um, Can I mention something about yeah, the yeah. cow pots? Yes. Um, the pea pots or cow pots, um, when you plant them in the ground, you don't want to have any of the pots sticking above the ground because it can actually wick the water um, and dry out the area around the the little plant. So you can just kind of cut it off or break off to the soil level and then plant it so it's under the ground. Right. And and on that good good point and on that note, um, they tend to dry out faster than plastic pots, just like terracotta as well. They absorb moisture from the outside and pull it away from what's in contact with them. So you would have to be more assiduous with watering than you would with plastic. Plastic are, I mean, yeah. I want to get away from plastic so badly too. I hate buying any more than I can possibly and I recycle and reuse like crazy, but um, they are very handy if you're going to be reusing them more often in the future. Otherwise, I'm sure you can enter a bargaining, a borrowing pact with your neighbor, uh, you know, promise to return their pots uh, sparkling clean and sterilized. I'm sure they'll be happy then to let you learn it for a season if you want, if you don't think you're going to be doing, you reusing them ever again. So yeah, great questions. What else have we got, Mike? Um, you know, you, um, should we also stop sharing the screen now? I think. Yeah, um, we can do that. I certainly can do. I, I think. Uh, there you go. Let's go away. All right, great. Oh, there's everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, good. And let's see. The next question I've got here is, um, which seeds are easiest for the beginners? Pam, you have a, you have a, uh, I, I think um, wild bergamot is easy. Um, Penstemon is easy. Um, Black eyed Susans are easy. Um, milkweeds are easy. Oh, gee, 
a lot of them are easy. Um, and I think I tend to be growing the ones that are um, a, probably a little more easy. I, I don't grow anything that needs two years of stratification. So, um, but yeah, if you, uh, anise hyssop is um, easy. It just needs to be su surface sown because it needs light to germinate. So, um, Oh, nodding alliums, nodding, uh, nodding onion is easy. Um, so I could kind of, I could probably go on, but certainly wild bergamot and it does not need stratification. Um, milkweed only needs 30 days of stratification. Just about every kind of milkweed that I've grown only requires 30 days. Um, yeah, so. Great. Yeah. And um, one thing, um, I bought in some um, river oats. Um, you might not be able to see them against this. Um, don't forget the grasses, especially if you want to create a little meadow effort, because the grasses have their own beauty. This one's been a little mangled, but this is kind of what they, they look like. Um, each of these little bits is a seed of its own. You have to break the whole thing. It's a, a little bit like oats and they arch gracefully into the ground so um they they help support your plantings as well and they have a beauty of their own as well so um they're very easy oh my gosh you know you'll be giving them away as christmas presents to everybody you know including those overseas i'm sure so very very prolific and easy um yeah, I'm trying to think of, um, yeah, the, the staples that you see in most gardens, those bright yellow, uh, the flowers with the um, brown cone head, the black eyed Susans, were super easy. And they come up the first year and they're flowering and they look very satisfying. Um, and, um, um, you know, the, the stuff that garden centers tend to sell a lot are generally the ones that you will find easiest to grow from seeds. I think we 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 um, have a bunch that we, I think the, the ones we gave out at the library are pretty easy too, aren't they, Pam? Um, Most of them. Um, the yeah. cardinal flower is a 60 day uh, cold stratification, but you still have plenty, plenty of time to do that. And um, so, but uh, cardinal flower, um, does not bloom the first year and some of your natives won't. They're gonna put all their energy into growing roots and they won't bloom until the second year or maybe if they bloom, it's just gonna be a very small bloom because again, all that root is getting established and once that root's established, they really just go crazy and, and you get, you know, the second or third year, you get a really beautiful bloom from your plants. Right, right, so if yeah. They if they don't bloom the first year, don't don't be concerned. I think you'll get blooms the second year. Yeah, keep watering, in other words, and yeah. hope. Yeah. Don't give up. Yeah. Here's, here's another question. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian says they are trying to turn their yard into a food forest. Ooh. Do you have any recommendations for native edible plants? Well, the nodding onion that Pam mentioned is definitely edible as well as beautiful. Um, milkweed is edible. Milkweed is edible. The flowers, the leaves, you know, this, the, the young shoots. Or young ones. When yeah, they're but young, yeah. Like broccoli. You have to put them through two changes of water. Well, but they're oh. delicious. So, so Julia, you eat them when they're adults, not just when they look like asparagus sprouts. Exactly. There are different things you can eat from milkweed. Because oh, that latex is rather toxic. You really got to make yeah. sure you get rid of it, right? That's why you put it through two changes of water and throw out the water before you finally season it with the butter and garlic and stuff. But they are very, very good. Okay. That's oh, right. Now, are daylilies a native plant? That's No, that's a Japanese ditch lily. Yeah. That, that orange that, one? But definitely eat them. Eat all the non-natives you can find. I, I personally endorse that. Get rid of them. Garlic <laughs> mustard. Yeah, oh, yeah garlic yeah. mustard. Oh my God. Right, so. What a scourge. <laughs> and other so, edibles are blue, your blueberries. Your, um, we have um, you know, black native black caps and lots of different um, berries that are, are edible. Um, what about pawpaws? Somebody has asked about pawpaws. 
Oh, yes. Oh, oh, we got some last year, the first year. I was so excited. I never had tasted it before. It was just great. Uh, now, what about poke leaf? leaf? Sorry, what? Poke leaf. leaf. Is that native? I, I, I wouldn't eat pokeweed. It's got a it's got a medicinal um, um, story with the roots and it needs certain treatments, but uh, it can. Well, I've been eating it for decades and look at me. You have? What, yes. What you do is you harvest the little shoots when they're maybe no, no taller than 10 inches. And then you put them again through two changes of boiling water for 10 minutes each. It's the same as with them and they're wonderful. Well, you shouldn't eat it when it gets mature and you shouldn't eat the oh. berries, they say. But the, the right. yeah, is it's wonderful. poisonous. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's amazing to hear. Um, I salute you for your courage. <laughs> I've been so, doing it for like, I don't know, five, six decades I mean, <laughs> every year. Wow. That's impressive. And then, of course, you have lamb's quarters. Yeah, those are not native either. They're not so, native. Yeah, okay. Yeah. No, eat the weeds. Go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another de a great delicacy, in fact, that's a native. Well, there's two. The one are, are fiddlehead ferns, um, and there oh, are yeah. only and specifically the ostrich fern. Other ferns will kill you, uh, but it's the ostrich fern as it's in uh, unfurling, and it looks like a fiddlehead. That's the time to eat it. Um, and yeah, again, we have them in our garden and we sell them. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's that, one of the first spring vegetables. Nice. Uh, yeah, exactly. And another great first spring vegetable are ramps. That's highly treasured. Um, where you can oh, get yeah. ramps, I'll tell you, is um, if you've ever been to Blooming Grove Farm, in the spring, they're usually selling them roots and all. So go and plant them. And uh, you, can, you can snip off the leaves, I guess, and, and have a taste. But um, go and plant them and let them let them grow a little bit more, you know. And and I would just harvest the leaves a little bit every year. Let them replenish their bulb first, though, so that they yeah. don't um, struggle the next year. But yeah, definitely. Um, um, yeah, somebody said yeah they so had somebody got sick from poke weed berries. Be careful. Yeah, yeah I berries. Agree. No, you don't eat the berries. Yeah, yeah. Just if you're not sure, don't touch. Um, but yeah, I, growing your own natives, absolutely great. Or, or, or harvesting um, your native. Blackberries, native blackberries are amazing, especially if they get a lot of sun <coughs> and they sweeten in the sun and they're not as tart. So, um, let, oh, June berries. Let's uh, see. Sorry, what, one last tree you have to absolutely have in your garden. It's called Amelanchia. <laughs> it's got several common names June berry, shad bush, service berry. Um, it's an understory, and I don't know why the berries haven't gone commercial. They're really lovely. Um, there is a shop in uh, in uh, if you want to go and taste them and see <laughs> for free in uh, an organic shop in uh, Rockland County in Chestnut Ridge called um, Hungry Hollow. They have a shad bush in the in a median in their parking lot, and it's just overflowing with berries every June. And just you know, go there and pick some and see if you want to grow a shad bush. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Sorry, uh, Mike, go ahead. You were, you were saying something. You, we, we are getting quite late. I think oh. what we'll do is this. We will save all the questions that are in the chat. And if some didn't get answered, when we send out a link to the video, we'll ask if Pam and Sonia could give answers to those. One last person has asked, um, this will be the last question of the night. Once planted, how heavily may native plants get browsed on by deer and rabbits and so forth? And do you grow these plant these more natural like a meadow, or do you grow these plants in a more formal gardening garden setting? Yeah, great. You want to have a first steps, Pam? Sure, sure. Um, you can. Uh, some some plants do um, really well as a meadow, and um, and some plants do very well in a garden setting. Um, and some will do well in either one. Penstemon is one of those that comes to mind. Um, they're a great garden plant and they can hold their own in meadows. Um, but as far as a deer and groundhogs, um, there are some plants. I have been growing a few gardens um, that are frequented by groundhogs and deer and bunnies. Um, so, 
there are plants that um, uh, if that have flavors and smells, the onion family, the mint family, the penstemon family, the um, milkweed family, and uh, native uh, hookara. Uh, they usually don't get brow get eaten. Uh, they may get browsed in the springtime before they've developed the strong chemicals or flavors that deter the animals. But usually if they get browsed, uh, they come back. They'll, uh, and once they're coming back, uh, usually it seems like there's a lot more food for the deer and the, um, the groundhogs that they're not just feeding in the garden. But there are times when you'll need to, you may need to fence off. If you have a deer population, um, I find that spraying is, it can be beneficial, but golly, if, if it rains and you don't get out there right away, you know, the deer can decimate everything. So um, if we're, you may have to just fence I, at some, at some places that's really probably the only real, um, you know, real hope <laughs> is fencing. Right. And, and there are also uh, degrees of quote, Im deer immunity that certain plants have, like nodding and anything that tastes strong and pungent, like onion family, yes. um, mint family, the, the monadas, the wild mints, um, et cetera. You know, anything that you can stuff a, a mouthful into your mouth and keep chewing for very long, that's going to have the same effect on the deer. It's like, blech, you know, it's way too strong a flavor. Um, and, and then things like goldenrod seem to be immune to deer virtually. Um, they just, just bust on all the time and, not, and don't get molested. So there's, 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 there are certain ones. What these seed sites will tell you, they'll, they'll give you a varying range of immunity to deer. You know, some deer uh, immune, uh, deer proofness and not deer proof or whatever that all very deer proof. Um, I'll give you some idea of them as well. You can also hide your um, tender non uh, or tender natives among the more pungent ones. You know, you can sort of um, build a little wall of smell around them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all sorts of strategies you can apply. You can have a dog uh, patrol your property and, um, you know, leave some um, smelly gifts behind to remind them that there's a predator around. That might help sometimes as well. You know, every everybody, uh, every garden I know disclaim has a disclaimer of, but there are different deer cultures. You know, so your deer might not eat what my deer eats, um, etc. Or they will go ahead anyway. So, it's right. it's always a running, you know, arms race with them. Very good, Michael. Uh, Michael, can I just say something? Uh, please we go? go ahead, Chad. I, I just want to thank uh, both speakers. It was amazing. And I'm glad we started from nothing and now we have a whole little movement. And I just want to remind everyone that we, this is all about uh, pollinating where we live in Warwick Valley. So this is the great way we thought to introduce you guys. And please visit the Albert Wisner Library and there's a beautiful display and they have seeds. And I'm hoping to get Greenwood Lake and Florida. So someone mentioned that as well, they're interested. Um, I guess you guys make your own display because I don't know who have made the Albert Wisner display it was quite beautiful. Um, and Sonia and Pam seem to have a decent amount of seeds. And you could uh, email growlocalgwl at gmail.com if you want to be part of this pollinator movement. And we're hoping to teach people the basics. And then we might have a few demonstration sites. And then also on your own, please take this on. And then hopefully we could have more and more demonstration sites. And before we know it, we're all covered. And I do want to also mention that we do have a Zoom garden plot that I do with Michael and Sarah and Michelle, I don't know if she's on this, that we will start probably in a month or two about uh, you know growing edible garden foods, but this is all, we're all part of the same family and uh, thank you all, appreciate it. Great, thank you everyone. Fantastic questions. Big round of applause. <laughs> to you as well. <laughs>